How do you remember Atal Bihari Vajpayee? I'm old enough to remember that when in May 2004, the Congress won an unexpected election, most pre-poll service predicted a comfortable return for the NDA led by Atal Bihari Vajpayee. As a 20-year-old, I remember driving past India Gate and Raisana Hills with my parents in the evening for some ice cream. The India Shining posters were plastered all over. For instance, they were on the giant lawns around India Gate and also opposite the National Museum on the road which is there. This is a vision of a rising confident India and it appealed to many metropolitan upper caste north Indians where BJP and Bajpayee's victory seemed inevitable yet not fated and then came the inevitable loss. As Prime Minister Manmohan Singh was sworn in for the UPA many were reluctant to forget Atal Bihari Vajpayee many are even reluctant to forget Atal Bihari Vajpayee even today. For instance many see in him a true champion of what they call as Indian values or they really like the oratory manner where he mixed hindu conservative thought with a globalized reality others were considering him the perpetual underdog who was once cheated out of power some consider him a visionary for large infrastructure projects such as the golden quadrilateral project now in all of this these selective breaks of memory make vajpay into what people want to remember him by and what essentially is their feeling towards such a person this is a form of collected memory but it's also a form of collective amnesia in which selectively we pick up facts and then we shape how we remember a person now this may be acceptable for people who are there in our personal life but quite often when it comes to political personalities it is very important for our, our memory to also meet objective assessment and it is here i think so that abhishek choudhury's book titled vajpay the ascent of the hindu right does us a great service today i'll be reviewing abhishek choudhury's book on vajpay from the years of 1924 to 1977 which provides not only a time capsule but also unearths facts about his life from original archival research as well as interviews his book runs in to about 332 pages and is set in a very gorgeous type set i completed it in about four settings ranging between about 6 to 8 hours spread over two weeks yes it took me longer to write out this review and shoot for youtube than to actually complete the book and i hope to get more disciplined at it as um, time goes on Now any review which I do on this channel is divided into three parts the first being what is this book about second being what are the significant takeaways and finally the rating so yes while this book is about vajpayee what is this book really about is set out in the preface by the author where uh, abhishek says he has two principal objectives the first being to examine vajpayee's link to the sang parivar and this becomes important to understand the influence vajpayee had on the rss and the rss in turn had on him and the second objective as abhishek puts it is to assess vajpayee's life not only as a tribute but one should read it as a detached unsentimental not to say insensitive tale on his career and moral character i believe the second is particularly useful for collective memory around political leaders and i've also started recently reading taylor sherman's book on nero in seven myths now Pishe goes about his objective with the book by breaking it into three parts. The first covers the early youth of Vajpayee, then his ascent into national politics, and the third and final part is devoted to the Indira Gandhi years. And if you're thinking, well, this timeline falls short, it's because this is just the first part of a two-part book. The second being released later in the year. Now, what are my five big takeaways from reading this book? The first is that any public personality always has a origin story. So, who is Vajpayee is shaped by where he's born. his father and the son vajpayee's birth and his early childhood is described in vivid detail from badeshwar and how his grandfather shamlal served as a priest to the local communities his father krishna bihari serving as a hindi teacher in the gwalior state which allowed him to get admission in school and also a good college now adult from his very early school days was fond of public oratory but he stammered and forgot his first speech Now as we well know he persisted and perfected his craft always showing a talent for wordplay. I think it's this kind of relationship which he had with his father is really instrumental in his life which provides him the kind of support and what he achieves later. As the book states 5 decades later Atul would still recall Babuji's death as the saddest moment in my life. 
The second relationship which I think is very influential on Bajpai as when he served as the private secretary of Shyam Prasad Mukherjee was the first organizer in the true sense of the Jansang as a political outfit. As the book quotes Atal's own words, Mr Mukherjee patted your back once with love and you would be ready to die for him. Second big takeaway for me was that the cultural influences on Bajpai were not only a part of his paternal upbringing but also a feature of a Hindu society that was trying and is still trying to define and articulate its values. This was first served through the Arya Samaj as the organizational touch point where he starts actually taking in this thought. But throughout college, he also displays a formative curiosity and a desire to form his own moral principles with diverse influences from Marxism to socialism. Here, Abhishek cites two early Vajpayee poems: his earlier surviving one titled Taj Mahal and another one called Kavi Aaj Suna Ek Dhanre. As we read their text, book plainly states. These poems reveal something extraordinary. They speak of the intense rage and victimhood Atal felt, and that he had come to have a sharp, if also a narrow and confused sense of India's history and geography, and the need for its revival, and a sense of his own place. Atal did well in college, and by that I mean he got into student politics, just the right amount of trouble, as well as arrested briefly, and his lifelong relish for bhang. Here, it is also important to note Atal's involvement and participation in India's independence movement, which is not substantial but was also not absent. As the book notes, the RSS and the Mahasabha were ambivalent about Quit India. The Mahasabha president Savarkar was determinedly opposed, apparently because it would hurt the militarization of Hindus. The RSS too, having already annoyed the government, didn't want to risk being banned altogether. On the ground, though, at least some RSS supporters at Victoria College stuck in the opposite direction. They didn't want to remain mere spectators when others were boycotting and sabotaging all things British. Atal, now a popular second-year intermediate student at Victoria College, joined the protesters. The third significant learning was Vajpayee's rise matched the ascent of the RSS that grew out of a need felt by the Arya Samaj and the Hindu Sapma Sabha for Hindu unity. Atal was literally at the cross junction of history, directing a path of communal and majoritarian organization, a journey that starts, as the book puts it. a political activist among journalists and a journalist among politicians the reference here is being made to mr bajpayee being the founding editor of the weekly bout piece of the rss called the panch janya named after krishna's shank the conch shell in the mahabharata in january 1948 so how does one separate bajpayee from the articles which are published in panch janya on a range of issues such as the rss views on minorities my own view is that sun's views were largely bajpayee's views and bajpayee's views were the sun's views even as there were points of mild debauchery and moral ambivalence for instance as abhishek notes while atal does not distribute sweets on gandhi's death as was done by many rss volunteers his own articles did hold gandhi responsible for partition and pandering to muslims the fourth feature of abhishek's writing which lends considerable objectivity is a critical look at the indian national congress during these decades For instance the book notes how a ban on the RSS was implemented in a half-hearted manner due to sympathizers within the Congress and how later Congress conservatives lobbied not only for a centralized law on cow slaughter but also wanted it absurdly to be included in the constitution's chapter on fundamental rights. It contains Vajpayee's lament on the use of state machinery such as an air force plane by Indira Gandhi for campaigning as well as other unfair practices and attempts to disrupt rallies and a tepid response from the election commission. We should also remember the ADM Jabalpur judgment by the Supreme Court which upheld the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus during the proclamation of emergency. These events are useful for us to think about the corrosive force of history as well as its larger role of small events which seem insignificant at a given point in time but lead to an organized erosion of what we see as institutional autonomy today. The fifth and the final element which is interesting are the early views of Atal. Some remain constant, many change. They also help explain the world view of the RSS and the BJP. For instance, he opposed large scale industrialization, framing it as a battle between man and machine, or opposed coal, the extravagance of the Bhakra Nangal Dam, or advocated for a compulsory military draft for the youth in India, and even a desire to dissolve state assemblies and establish a unitary administration at the center. Well, you may say that this was because he was in the opposition, but these views are very important for us to consider as to what remains constant and what changes. And here, again, Abhishek notes, in some ways Atal's views on citizenship and secularism were beginning to broaden. He no longer thought of all Indian Muslims 
as active collaborators in the Pakistan project who had stayed back only to sabotage the truncated land of the Hindus, but he still doubted their loyalty. So, bigotry does remain in his thought and this is very well demonstrated through a parliamentary sp speech called Ab Hindu Mar Nahi Khayenge, which was also distributed by the Sangh Parivar in response to charges of their involvement in communal violence. It would only make things worse. So what's my rating? I mostly agree with the Goodreads rating of 4.39. This book is exceptional for its modern writing and its tight prose, and yet it substantively maintains fidelity to fact. It has the right amount of what we North Indians like to call as chaska, with comments about Vajpayee's romantic life, which I've intentionally left out, best served to be read for the color and depth that they provide within the book than in a short video review such as this. I would recommend you read this book, and I personally cannot wait for part two to come out. I expected to obviously cover Vajpayee's term as Prime Minister but also his relationship with Narendra Modi and the famous press conference on the need to follow Raj Dharma after the 2002 anti-Muslim Gujarat riots. Finally, how should we remember Vajpayee? This is a difficult and I think so also a very individualistic answer. It depends on each person but I would recommend that as much as each person feels about our political leaders very very differently they should also engage with their objective assessments which are provided through books such as this. And this is not everything. These also need to be very open conversations we need to have between family, friends and strangers with those who we not only agree but also deeply disagree. If for nothing, to maintain a spirit of dialogue which is very important in India which should not have a spirit of divisiveness. My own memory and assessment of Vajpayee is of an extraordinary public orator whose own moral practices mixed with forms of ambivalence challenged Hindu conservative thought, but yet at the same time created a subterfuge, a camouflage for a communal poison that flows in our veins today. Let me not end on an happy note. And to quote a poem by Harivan Shirai Bachchan, which was also used by Atal as a metaphor not only for his own life, but the cyclical nature of anyone else's. Mitti ka tan, masti ka man, chan bar jeevan, mera pariche. Thank you so much for tuning in and I hope to meet you again under the shade of our Amal Tas tree. Thank you.